Ladies and gentlemen, friends of literature, friends of culture, I'm very happy to welcome you tonight for a very special event of Book World Prague 2021. I feel like it's a rebirth because, well, as you know, we have been silent for two years and a half now. You all know why. And tonight, um, I'm very happy to be here with you, not just because I'm the artistic director of the fair, but also because as you, I am a lover of books. I like to read books. I like to listen to the voice, but I also like to listen to the voice of their authors. Tonight we are back, and tonight for this very special event, we have a very special guest, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Thank you for being with us. And I have to thank you also for something. We are back here, and we are not back to normal, unless exceptional is normal. Because your voice, your books, your talk, your thoughts, are all resonating through the world, from Lagos to New York, to London, to Berlin, and tonight to Prague. Thank you. And for this exceptional meeting, we decided to move it into an exceptional place, the Gulliver Airship, a place which exists nowhere else like that but in Prague. And we are very happy to show something exceptional of Prague. I am very happy to be with you on the stage. However, I'm also very impatient to stop talking, to go to sit and to listen to you. Thanks a lot. Have a nice talk. Thank you. Guillaume, thank you very much for your introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome one of the most widely acclaimed writers in the English language, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, who arrived today, as I, as, as I heard. Uh, she's uh, tired from, from, from lengthy traveling, but uh, it's, um, it's a unique event, and I'm, uh, and I'm really glad that you found time to be with us and to share uh, your thoughts with us. Uh, I will start with, with, with a question that inspired me when I read one of your interviews. In one of the interviews that you gave, you complained about an unpleasant experience that you had s with French custom officers or something like that. And so, so I want to just make sure that everything was fine in Prague. <laughs> No, it was terrible in Prague. No, I'm joking. Um, so thank you everyone for being here. My first time in Prague. Um, I haven't had a chance to see Prague, so I haven't had a chance to see whether Prague lives up to its reputation of being the most handsome city in Europe. I hope it does, because otherwise I'll be terribly disappointed. The reason that I cannot answer your question honestly is because I did not... Um, arrived directly from Lagos to Prague. Mm -hmm. um, and so because I came from, uh, where did I connect? Frankfurt. So, I, so I didn't actually go through, ah. yeah. I went through immigration in Frankfurt, not in Prague. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> so uh, let's start with questions. Um, your novels, uh, most of your books have been translated into Czech and as far as I can tell, uh, these are very fine translations indeed. Uh, Americana was uh, your Czech publisher told me today was one of the most successful of your books. So I would like to start with a question related to Americana. In that book, uh, there is uh, it takes place roughly before the election of Barack Obama, um, the American president, and there is a certain kind of optimism in that book. The optimism related to his person and, and, and the hope that him in the office might change something about, uh, about the ills of, of American society. Mm, uh, has this hope been fulfilled or not? Um, <laughs> I think, well, obviously, what came after Barack Obama I think was very telling, um, and maybe is a good answer to the question, which is I think that the fact that um, 
the president after Barack Obama, <laughs> his name I just do not enjoy saying. I think it I think it said something about Obama. In other words, I think that president in some ways was a result of Obama. So a kind of backlash, I think. So maybe the answer to the question then is that no, the, the hope that um, and the optimism that I think is in Americana and that I had personally, um, and I had that as well throughout Obama's presidency, kind of felt um, squashed, diminished by the new pres the president who came after Obama. But I should also say that I don't think and I don't think I necessarily expected Obama to be a messiah. I think that one of the problems I felt in the way that he was perceived is that the expectations on him were way too high, too much. It's impossible to fix a problem that's been there for decades, right? America's problems. And you know, America is a place I, I feel a strong affinity to. It's my second home. And you know, I love it sometimes. And I, I don't, I didn't expect Obama to solve all of America's problems. I think actually for me, part of the reason I felt so optimistic was, if anything, really the symbolic importance of Obama becoming president. Because I really think that sim sim symbolism matters. Um, and obviously I thought his politics was okay. But I, and my point is I, I, I didn't expect that he would solve all of America's problems. Did, did he solve some of them? Then? I think so. I mean, I think that there are things, some decisions he made that I thought were good. Um, some that I didn't necessarily agree with. Um, I think in general that, I think in the US, the Democratic Party obviously is a party I think that just makes a bit more sense mm -hmm. <laughs> and has a bit more compassion. Um, I, I do think that Obama had a particularly difficult time because he was dealing with um, a United States Congress that was determined because it was dominated by the Republicans, was determined to, as actually one of them said, make him a one-term president. So I think it, it made things difficult for him, a kind of, just a kind of automatic opposition to almost anything that he wanted to do. I think he would have achieved more had he not had that kind of, um, uh, you know, that kind of really unique problem. And where do you see America now, I mean, uh, after? after Trump's presidency. I mean, hmm. is it new hope? <laughs> you know what, after Trump, I feel like anything would be ho hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, I mean, uh, yes, I think that um, it's, it's just a nice feeling. I remember watching the news when Biden won and I was in Lagos, so I wasn't in the US, but just feeling that finally a grown up was back in charge. It just, and there's something about it that's reassuring when you just think it's like, for so long, um, four years, you gave the keys of the car to a toddler. And then, all of a sudden, a grown-up is back. And of course, the grown-up is not going to be perfect. The grown-up is going to make mistakes. But you just feel a bit more comfortable because it's an adult. So that's how I feel about America right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, I was asking, especially in regards to problems that are be being discussed by by scholars, by, by lawyers, that there are books, you know, on American legal system mm -hmm. uh, about r racism in the legal system, and, and you know, the the orange is the new black and stuff and li like that. Mm -hmm. So I was asking whether you you have hope that something might change in this regard, because you speak eloquently in your interviews about racism in the attitudes of people. But um, I, I I wonder whether there is any hope that that something might change in the system. I think President Biden has opportunities that Obama, because he, in some ways, <laughs> Obama being a black man, I think was really the major reason that Republicans wanted to just squash anything he wanted to do. Biden doesn't have that problem. He just has the usual problem of the terrible polarized nature of American politics. But I think he has an opportunity, Biden, and so, you know, I think, for example, 
conversations around um, voting rights, which is really a conversation about race. Mm -hmm. I mean, the problem in America, and one of the things I found really interesting when I first went to the US was how, how often race is talked about using proxy language. So, and, and it took me a while to understand this. So when people would talk about states' rights, and I would, I would notice that people would really get very upset. And I used to wonder, well, wh why? I mean, states' rights sounds okay to me. But actually, it's a conversation about race. Because it goes back to the Civil War, where the war was really about maintaining slavery, but they used the language of states' rights. Oh. So now in the US, whenever Republicans say states' rights, people on the left get very upset because it's about race. And so the voting rights that they're talking about now, um, wait, one of the states just passed a really um, repressive bill about um, voting rights. But, but again, they use the language of states' rights. You know, a state should determine how they, um, how they uh, organize their voting. But when you decide, for example, that People cannot vote unless they show three different forms of identification at the voting um, station. You're targeting black people because in general, it's black people who are unlikely to have three different kinds of um, identification. But actually when they're having the conversation, they're not mentioning race, but really it's about race. I think Biden has an opportunity to um, yeah, I mean, structural racism in America took 300 years mm -hmm. to establish, so it's going to take a long time to dismantle. But I, I do think that he has opportunities that I hope he uses. But also, I think he also has the, the difficulty of how deeply polarized American politics is now, where I feel as though Republicans don't actually think about what will benefit the country. They're just really out to try and destroy anything that comes from the Democrats. And it's, it's such an immature way <laughs> to deal with. Do you, do you think it's just politics or is it society at large yeah, that's polarized? Yeah, yeah, I think society is polar polarized, yes. Um, it's interesting to think about which came first. Because 25 years ago, American politics was not this polarized, nor was American society. I don't want to be that person who blames the former president for everything. <laughs> But I do think that he contributed a lot to the polarization in the US. I, mean, I, I think, I really believe that leadership sets the tone for a society. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a leader who you know, thinks and talks in a particular way, it's going to affect the way that people down with the grassroots relate to one another. And um, so I think, I really do think that the former president in the US contributed to the polarization of society. But yes, the society is so polarized. There are things that have been politicized that shouldn't be. And one of them is, is this pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, the way that in the US, you know, you board a flight in the US today and they spend 10 minutes telling you that it's federal law to wear a mask. Because masks and vaccines have become such politicized subjects where people are screaming at each other in, in school. Same here, same here. Really? Oh, so I guess we can't blame Trump then. <laughs> Who can we blame? I mean, I just find it, you know, it, it's such an interesting thing to me that, that one can politicize science, mm -hmm. right? And um, that's interesting that it's here because I, I, I was thinking, I mean, having sort of observed Germany, for example, or the UK, um, that it's not that much of a phenomenon in the way that it is in the US, where people attend um, meetings to sort of talk about their towns, and it ends up being a shouting match about wearing masks. And I'm thinking, but it's actually to save lives. So I find that, I guess my point is, there's a kind of polarization of subjects that shouldn't really mm. be politicized at all. But that's the case in the US now. Everything, almost everything is political. Well, it's um, more or less the same, especially with the with the extremist parties that, the, mm. that, that use, you know, the, the fight against vaccines and, 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 and so on and so forth. Um, and what about the relationship to history? Because in America, because of its uh, slavery, 
has deeply troubled history. So mm -hmm. is there any kind of development that you have seen in recent years? I don't actually like, I mean, I, slavery is interesting, but I guess, but not to me really. And I'll tell you why, because I think when people talk about race in the US, um, especially people who want to be dismissive of race, they will say, oh, slavery happened, but you know, it ended. And, and I think that the problem with race in the US, I mean, obviously started with slavery, but actually the problem with race in the US is about things that happened in the 1950s and the 1960s, you know? I mean, so things that happened long after slavery, long after the brief period that they called Reconstruction, and, you know, the, I, my American home is in Maryland, for example, and I just find it really incredible that 30 years ago, 20 years ago, around the state of Maryland, there were communities that would drain swimming pools so that black people would not swim. I mean, they would rather shut down their pool than have one black family swim. And I find that incredible, and it's relatively recent. You know, that in Boston in the 1970s, you had, you know, adults, men and women, screaming at little children who wanted to go to school because they did not want the schools to be, um, they did not want black kids in their, in their children's schools. And so I, you know, and for me, I think about things like those children today are in their 50s. And... For me, the question is, what is the damage that has been done? Because these children have inherited a terrible kind of, um, it's, a, it's a terrible inheritance of, of pain, of being made to feel that you're inferior, and these are the people who are alive today in the US, and it's not really acknowledged and talked about, and that for me is a big problem. So I just, you know, I, slavery, yeah, it doesn't interest me very much. Okay, uh, well, I, I, I uh, perhaps articulated the question wrongly. Uh, what I meant, history at, at yeah, large. Yeah, yeah. I, I was shocked the other day. It was, I think, in the Times of the Supplement. I read about the, the terrible massacre in the 20s, the Tesla massacre in Oklahoma or somewhere. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. They, and, they, and they said in the article that that children in Oklahoma were actually not allowed to learn about this terrible mm. event at mm. schools. Mm. So it struck me as, mm. uh, as mm. outrageous yeah. that on the one hand, yeah. you have universities who pay so much attention to all kinds of problems, sometimes imaginary, and on the other hand, on the other hand, you have children not being allowed to, to learn about the history. Can I ask for some examples of the imaginary problems that universities pay attention to? Uh, because I find this very interesting. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm I no, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't go into, be, be being a lecturer at university, I wouldn't go into much detail. <laughs> no, I, you, no, know, I, you know what, you, no, you I get, get what your I point. mean. No, yeah. to completely, I take your point. Um, no, you're right. I mean, I also find it, in general, I mean, the, the history of African Americans, and, and I, and by that I mean, I don't mean black Americans, I mean African Americans, which is to say the people whose descendants were enslaved, right? Because today you have black Americans whose families came from Nigeria or Ghana, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. But African Americans, I mean, the history of African Americans in, in the US is just not, it's not taught, it's not as well known as it should be. And I find that, I mean, honestly, I just find it shocking. When I first came to the US, I had to learn it on my own because I didn't understand. There was so much I didn't understand about America. I didn't understand race. I didn't really get racism because I had come from Nigeria where everybody was black. And so I get to the US and suddenly I'm black. And it's a new identity because in Nigeria, I didn't think of myself as black. I did not need to think of myself as black. And it also meant that I had to learn about racism um, and so I remember making the choice to go to the library all the time and to read African-American history and African-American literature. And I was just shocked. Right? I remember the first time I read about the, the massacres in, in Oklahoma. And I remember thinking, really? I mean, this isn't that, that long ago. Um, there was a similar massacre in uh, where now? Somewhere in the, in the south. Again, of a thriving black community of lawyers, doctors, 
and suddenly you have white Americans who feel very resentful about this, and they find a small reason, and they burn down that area, and you know, sort of just chase the people out. And, and the fact that this is not widely known, I think is also part of the problem, because it means that the conversations in the US today about race are so, um, I, I, I'm going to say polarized, but I guess we've said that enough. But I guess my point is that increasingly, I think that if we knew more, if America made African-American history more known, more um, ordinary, more sort of, if, if the average American knew African-American history, it seems to me that many of the conversations about race would not be as fraught as they are because it's very easy for people who do not know to be dismissive of genuine concerns of African-Americans. So an African-American is talking about racism and, and invariably you will hear somebody say, oh, but slavery ended 100 years ago, what are you talking about? Because these people, I think a lot of them do not know what happened after slavery. People kind of know vaguely, oh, Martin Luther King gave the speech and then black people could vote. But actually, you don't even know that even after the Voting Rights um, Act was passed, so many African Americans still had a lot of difficulty actually voting. And because people don't know this, I think it makes the conversation so difficult to have and so easy to dismiss. And, and even expressions like white supremacy, which is quite common in, in sort of leftist circles in America, it's very easy for people to dismiss because they're like, what are you talking about? That's a bit dramatic, right? But if they actually knew the history, it's not dramatic at all, it's the truth. So I, I feel very strongly that history, um, history matters. I mean, I, I feel this way about history everywhere, of course, <laughs> Nigeria as well. But um, in the US, I think African-American history in particular. Mm -hmm. You captured this unique experience of coming to America from Nigeria in Americana. Mm -hmm. And do you think that uh, the fact that you live in both countries gives you, even today, some kind of special perspective on American life? Um, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I, special, not necessarily better. <laughs> Different, yes, mm -hmm. it does, because I am not an American, but I am a person, I like to describe myself as a Nigerian who likes America. And I think not being an American, I don't think I will ever be an American. Um, and so what it means then is that I'm looking at it always from the outside. And even for me as a Nigerian, spending my half, half of my time in the US means that I'm also looking at Nigeria from the outside. So there's a sense in which, it's not that I don't belong in either place, it's that I think it's, uh, I like to think that I'm able to see both places with, with a kind of clarity that distance gives you. And would you be able to compare US and the UK, I mean, in terms of the problems that you out just outlined, mm. is there any difference? I don't really, I sometimes feel like I really can't talk about the UK well because I don't know it in that kind of lived way. You know, London is one of my favorite cities in the world, but I don't really get all the nuances mm -hmm. um, of, of the British. But obviously, I have my... <laughs> Having, you know, Nigeria having been colonized by the British, I have my very strong opinions about certain things. Um, and also feel a connection. You know, this is the thing about coming from a place that was um, formerly colonized by another place. You, you do feel a connection to your colonizer. Um, and so maybe it's why I love London. Maybe it's why, you know, English literature speaks to me. And but, I, but in terms of making comparisons about kind of day-to-day -day social realities. Mm. I, I don't know that I can. I think, you know, sort of, it's, it's common for people to say the problem in the UK is class, not race, but I don't think that's true at all because, you know, you talk to black British people and you realize that race is a big problem. But I, I don't feel that I know, know it in a very textured way. I, I, I should think London is slightly different than the rest of the country, isn't it? And this is true, the, yes, the, the but even London, yeah, yeah. But even London has its uh, <laughs> many problems when it comes to race. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> let's let's move to to literature and, and to, to to your writing, to more technical stuff. Uh, 
since you live in the two countries, do you see yourself as a part of the American literature or Nigerian literature or simple literature in English or global literature? Literature written in English. Yeah. I think, <laughs> and I see that with a kind of, um, um, I think, I'm, I, I think I'm, I'm being quite intentional about saying literature in English because it's not a denial of my being Nigerian and obviously knowing that my work is part of Nigerian literature. But it's because those labels often for me can be problematic. They're often for me, they're not so much about literature as they are about politics. They're, they're, not, li they're not literary labels, mm -hmm. especially if you're a person who comes from a part of the world that is not considered powerful. So I in some ways, it's, it's almost like being in you know, kind of like a glorified ghetto mm -hmm. um, where, you know, African literature is a thing that you read when you want to feel that you're a good person who cares about the poor people of the world, right? But literature from Western Europe and America is what you read when you just want to read literature. And so because of that, I've often felt a kind of um, reluctance about labels. I remember actually a friend of mine in uh, Sweden saying that <laughs> he would often give people books as presents, but he, when he wanted to show that he was a good person, he gave them books set in Africa. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I was so troubled by this, you know, and, and then when the people would get the books, they too would feel very noble and good because look, we're reading about those poor starving people. And even if the book was not about poor starving people, the fact that it's an African book mm -hmm. meant somehow that they were touching their innate goodness. <laughs> so really, I, um, no, I, so I consider my work part of the canon of literature written in English. <laughs> some, of, some of your Czech colleagues, writers, friends of mine, would tell you that still you have a huge advantage since you are, you know, ev even if coming from not the, the most powerful country in the world, not in the US, but still you have the privilege of writing in English, which is actually, you know, English has this huge impact and you have or the audience, the global audience actually. So, and you spoke about yeah. underrepresentation of, of uh, some literatures. What do you see as this problem? No, you're right, absolutely. I actually was thinking at the airport today in Prague how incredible it is and how in a way um, sort of the accidental privilege that I have as a, nat as a native English speaker. And it's an accidental privilege because I happen to have been born in a country that was colonized by the British because you know, had we had my family shifted a bit geographically and sort of fallen into the Republic of Benin, I would be a French speaker because Benin was <laughs> was was um, colonized by the French. But this accidental privilege is one that I find just really remarkable now. Thinking about it, I'm, I'm walking through the airport in Prague, and all of the signs are written in Czech and in English. You know, um, and and there is a kind of what worries me is that, I mean, obviously I'm happy to have this privilege, right? I mean, but at the same time, I, I, I think about it a lot because, you know, it can give rise to a certain kind of arrogance and a certain kind of closedness where I, wait, where was I? I think in Iceland, and I'm giving a menu at a restaurant, and I then say, oh, it's not in English. And I remember thinking later, but this is very stupid. You know, you're in Iceland. Why the F should it be in English? But it's the kind of, it's that kind of, you know, because English is the global language today in a way that I think 150 years ago it would have been French. And so it, it, I think it, it can create a kind of, if one isn't careful for, for the native English speaker, a lack of curiosity, a closedness and arrogance, because, you know, I'm like, the, the menu in Iceland is not in English and that was a problem for me because... <laughs> But yes, I do, I do recognize that writing in, in English um, brings about a privilege. And, and you know what? I do have to say that for, for me, an Anglophone African, and for other Anglophone Africans, you know, maybe it's the one privilege that we get. Mm -hmm. do you know? I mean, we really don't have many others. <laughs> so, so, you know, I think we should keep that. <laughs> uh, you wrote a few novels, some uh, essays, Block 
and so on. As what is the relation between these two forms of writing for you? Is, is the criticism extension of your fiction writing or vice versa? <laughs> That's interesting. I don't know actually. Hmm. No, I do know. I, I don't think it's a, mm, it's a different form for me. When I wh what I can say is that when I write nonfiction, it, nonfiction is not the love of my life. Fiction is the love of my life, and so in some ways, it's it's like the relationship between the man you really love and the man that you think is okay. So, <laughs> so so fiction is the love of my life. When I'm writing fiction, I am. It's just it's what makes me so happy. It's what gives me meaning. It's a thing that I deeply love. Nonfiction, I do it a lot more consciously. I know what I'm doing. I know what I want to do with nonfiction. With fiction, I don't. With fiction, I'm kind of going on a journey. Um, I think with nonfiction, I'm also not as honest as I am in fiction because I'm, I'm shielding myself, I'm self-censoring to an extent. But I have to say that that change with that my, the, um, what I wrote about my father and about grief um, most recently, I, I didn't feel that same kind of conscious um, shielding of myself. It felt almost like writing fiction in the sense that I was in this place where I was just writing. Oh, it, was it was very open, I think. I, mm. I, I like, liked it, all those sad it was. Mm. Thank you. Uh, and okay, well, let's speculate. I mean, the, the success of your blog and what, what you wrote on the internet was phenomenal. And, and, and the blog features in Americana as a very powerful tool of writing and we have many people who write successful on the internet. Mm, I am curious, um, because in the music industry, what happened was that many of the bands and singers left the labels and started publishing on their own. Mm. So uh, my question, speculative, is whether something like this might happen in the publishing industry, that, <laughs> that successful writers will just get rid of their publishers. <laughs> I hope your agent isn't here. I think my Czech publisher is here. So I think we should talk about this later. <laughs> no, I, you know why I, I, I don't necessarily think that that might work very well in publishing is, it's because I think most people who love books still want to hold a book, you know? I do. Me, me too, but so you're yeah. in favor. You, you think the, the love for the physical object yes. will eventually prevail? I think so. I think so. But I also think that, it w I, think, oh, I think in some ways we might actually ha end up having a kind of hybrid mm -hmm. um, form or situation where I do think that more, more writers will write online. I have writer friends who 10 years ago would have said, oh, I'm never going to publish in an e-magazine. That's not a serious thing. But now they are. Right? But at the same time, that the love for the physical book, I think, I, I don't think that's ever going to go away. So, and we need publishers for that. And and <laughs> would you be able to compare publishers in in the U.S. and in Nigeria? S are there differences? Because yeah. there are certain great differences between American and Czech markets. So I. Mm. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Of course. The, I mean, I'm, I mean, you know, America has America has sort of this, the power of of size and money and um, it's just such a large market and which means then that the possibilities really are endless. And also that I with the right kind of, um, I guess with the right kind of marketing and work, you find your niche in America. In Nigeria, which is really, you know, w we are Africa's most populous country. And <laughs> we're supposed to be, you know, you sort of read all of these projections about population and they tell you in you know, 20 years, Nigeria and Brazil and China were going to, I don't know, destroy the world and take over everything. We might invade the Czech Republic. But um, despite that, that population advantage, it doesn't quite translate to a market for books. So, so the market for books is quite small. And you know, it's many things. It's, it's economics as well. Right, that people, um, Nigeria has a, a thriving middle class, but people with disposable incomes still have to choose what they want to spend it on. And books, I think, are the <laughs> very low. So people will spend money on music in Nigeria. They'll spend money on cinema. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but you tell them that a book costs 5,000 naira and they go like, that's very expensive. But they'll spend that on a music concert very easily or downloading music or whatever. I'm sure you can tell that I have issues with this because I think they should buy books. But so, so that it's, it's different and um, yeah, it's different. But I, but I think the other thing though is that there's a lot of um, um, what I'm going to call recycling in reading. So people pass books on to one another, which is why you cannot actually get a, an accurate sense of how widely read a book is just from the sales figures. Mm -hmm. yeah. And could you please share with our audience your kind of your success story, how you sort of made a breakthrough in American industry because uh, I haven't heard you talk about it and that would be interesting. Um, hmm. How did I make a breakthrough? Have I made a breakthrough? Well, I would say most definitely. <laughs> Seriously. I <laughs> so when I started out, um, when I started out in, uh, my first novel was published in 2004, no, no, 2003, Purple Hibiscus in the US. And I remember the years before that, trying to, how, how I tried to get a publisher. And, um, and obviously things have changed now, especially with the internet. But at the time I would go to the library, I would get this book called The Writer's Marketplace, very thick book. And it was a list of agents. And so I would look through it and I was always looking for the agent who listed among their interests, the word ethnic, because it meant that they were willing to publish people who, kind of people like me, who were not American, who came from somewhere else. And so I would send out letters to them, and then they would send me rejections back, and that went on and on. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and the first novel I wrote, which, which is not Purple Hibiscus, which is a terrible novel, I would send it out to agents, and I remember this agent sent the first page back with the word N or just scrawled in large letters across the page. <laughs> and honestly, I remember thinking, what the, you know, if you're going to say no, at least be nice about it, you know? <laughs> so that it's easier to deal with. So I got all of these rejections. And I remember at some point, um, another agent said to me, I think, I think the difficulty was that I was, um, I think American marketing in general thrives on sort of somebody being the new something, right? American, American marketing, even for films, I think, and music is not necessarily one that encourages originality. So they're always kind of looking for what you're like. And so I had agents who said to me, you're not like any, anybody. So I can't sell you because I cannot say you're the new so-and-so. You know, you're black, you're from Nigeria, you're a woman, <laughs> there's nobody like you. And so one of the agents said to me, if you were Indian, then it would be easier for me. <laughs> and honestly, I wanted to become Indian. I was like, how, you know, how can I do this? So I can, and they said to me, because at the time Arundhati Roy um, was sort of you know, fairly well known in, in the US. And so the agent said to me, if you were Indian, then you would be the new Arundhati Roy. But you're not, you know. So finally, I got this lovely woman who was just starting out as an agent, and she said, I will take a risk and take you on. And, um, and then the small publisher, Algonquin, um, published my first novel, and I was so excited and so happy because I really loved Algonquin and what they did. And it was, you know, they were small at the time, they were, in the, they were kind of southern. They, anyway, so Purple Hibiscus is published. Um, I was told not to have expectations, and I didn't. I was just so happy somebody had published me. And, um, and so, and then it became a, and so independent bookstores were selling it, hand selling it. And I just remember being so thrilled when it, when it was on the indie bestseller list, which might mean that it sold maybe 50 copies, right? But still, I mean, for me it was really, I, I was very excited. And then it was published in the UK, and. I think um, the, the, and then my next novel, Half of a Yellow Sun, which, you know, again, was a book that the American market, uh, in my opinion, didn't quite know what to do with it, right? And I used to joke and say to people, if it had been about Darfur, because at the time, Darfur was in the news all the time, 
maybe it would have done better than it did, but it wasn't about Darfur, it was about Biafra, which was this you know, country that had existed for three years and no longer existed, and people were kind of vague about what it was. So Half of the Yellow Sun was a book that actually was much more embraced in the UK because you know, Nigeria is just more familiar to the British. I think it was Americana um, that maybe made, uh, I, I don't know, this breakthrough. Mm. I think Americana is really what made it happen. And maybe it's because it was kind of about America. I don't know. I should, th I should think so. I mean, yeah. that makes perfect sense. And did you have any feedback from American readers that the experience which you just ex a few minutes ago described, you know, of coming into the US mm -hmm. and and realizing to kind of to that that the col color of your skin matters. Uh, was it something that 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 struck them as strange? Yes, yes, yes. Quite a few. Yes, um, yeah. I, I I still hear that quite a bit when Americans are surprised because I think unless you actively think about it, people just assume you know black is just one monotonous blur of black with no differentiation of, <laughs> of people and their experiences. And so I, I did hear about from many Americans who said that they found it really interesting and it made them think about, about race and racism in their country because what it, what it does is that it forces you to acknowledge that this is not some sort of universal thing or some kind of inevitable thing, you know, that it's the thing that's very specific to your country, right? Mm -hmm. Um, obviously, racism exists in other places, but the, the, the manifestations are different. So you, you look at racism in Brazil, it's different from racism in America, it's different from racism in the Czech Republic, I don't know, of all the, you know, of all the seven black people here. But anyway, um, are there black people in the Czech Republic? Not so much. Uh, okay. But I'm sure that, yeah. So anyway, um, I, the, other, you know <laughs> the other thing I would often hear about from American readers was black hair, um, especially from men who were just amazed about the about black women's hair and who had never thought about these things. I remember a, a kind of a friend of a friend saying to me, what? You mean that isn't real? You mean like the braids are not like real hair? And they're just shocked. And it made me think about when I, <laughs> the early years in the US when I would get my hair braided with extensions and when I took the braids out, Americans would be like, you cut your hair. And I'm thinking, no, I didn't. And then when you get the braids the next two weeks, they're like, my God, your hair grew so fast. As though black people have some kind of magical um, elixir that we drink in the morning to make our hair grow fast. <laughs> but yeah, so I'm happy that Americana um, was a source of uh, useful information. Well, it was, <laughs> it was <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was, new, it was new for me. I was reading it and I was just wondering, why is she so obsessed with hairdresser? <laughs> I mean, it's always she's always searching yeah. for you, hairdresser. Yeah. And then I then I got it, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I have um, no and and a, a friend of mine who well somebody who became a friend said he he tried to read the novel the first time, and he was like, what is this hair hair hair? And he stopped, and then he tried later and then continued. And I was like, well, thank you. But I think it's also because it's easy to be dismissive of things like hair and think that. You know, hair just seems a bit trivial. But when you think about it in the way that hair is political, especially, I mean, hair is political for women. And you linked it to, to the accent, which was very important. Mm, mm. The various accents that people speak with. That yeah. Was, that was, that was yeah. Okay, I would ask our audience if they have any questions for our distinguished guest. If you have, we'll pass you the mic and you can ask. Are there any questions that you want to ask of over there? Hi everyone, good evening. It's a black person. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a black person. So exciting. Hi, Chimamanda. Hello. And welcome to Prague. Thank you. And I'm so excited to see you. Um, my name is Chinon So, and I'm, I guess by that name you know where it's coming from. One name more kekedu. Thank you. Ademba. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm from Nigeria, and then uh, I'm from the Igbo 
same part she's coming from. So I'm so excited to see my sister here. Uh, I'm in Czech, I based in Czech Republic, and uh, I live in a small village called Slani. So, <laughs> um, it's so uh, amazing to see you here. I also saw some of your works, and uh, I'm amazed, and I'm also proud of you, so to say. Uh, I have a very interesting question to ask. Uh, I know we, we've been talking about everything uh, from our side, uh, but right now I want to kind of take you home. That's so, because uh, charity begins from home, they say. So, uh, one of your books, uh, Half of a Yellow Sun, uh, talked about the Biafran. And uh, it's something people don't know quite much about. It's about this people that has been through a lot in Nigeria that people don't really know about. And uh, I want to know what really uh, inspired you to uh, bring it out, uh, such a beautiful story. And also, what's your journey so far? Are you stopping or do you have something more to put out for the people to know that this is really a struggle and shouldn't, uh, shouldn't stop at some point? Thank you very much. Um, so, why did people laugh when he said he lived? Is there something about that village? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, no, the, so I wrote, I wrote Half of a Yellow Sun because I wanted to understand that, that period of Nigerian history. I wanted to understand the Nigerian Biafra War. And I call it the Nigerian Biafra War rather than the Nigerian Civil War because even that, I think, is, is a political choice. It's a choice that, um, so in other words, calling it the Nigerian Biafra War is saying that I'm acknowledging that for three years, Biafra was a country. And that to call it the Civil War is to deny that reality. Um, so for the people in Biafra, until Biafra was um, defeated, they were not Nigerians. And I think that that's important to acknowledge. I wrote it because, you know, I grew up in the shadow of that war. My parents lost everything they owned. Both my grandfathers died in refugee camps. Um, and so growing up, you know, I, I knew that this thing had happened and that it had affected my family, but I didn't quite understand it. And I also knew that it was a shadow hanging over really Igbo people. And we didn't learn very much about it in school. And I kind of wanted to, in some ways, tell the story for my generation of Nigerians. And it's when people ask me, why did you choose to write about Biafra? I often say I did not choose Biafra, Biafra chose me. Because I don't remember a time when I sat down and said, I will now write about Biafra. Just, I've just always been interested because I grew up in its shadow. And my parents would gesture to things that had happened, but they wouldn't actually say much until I started to you know, <laughs> question them and question all the adults I came in contact with. And then I went out and I read everything, um, really, really, almost everything that had been published about that period. I listened to um, radio broadcasts during the war. I um, looked at, you know, newspaper articles. I just really immersed myself in that period. And for maybe two years, I was just completely obsessed with researching. And then I started writing the novel. And really, for me, it was you know, both personal, because it was about my grandfathers and my parents. But also, I felt that my generation needed to know the story, because we cannot know how we got here until we look back. So yeah, that's why I, did, that's why I, um, I wrote it. And it's really, it's the novel that, and it's the book, really, that has the most emotional significance for me of all of the things that I've done. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, one, one more question. This, this is very Nigerian okay. behavior. <laughs> we, we don't, um, you know, so he, if, if that thing is not pulled away from his hand, he will not let go. <laughs> <laughs> Last it's question, I promise. Oh, <laughs> uh, I was meant to know that though, when the movie came out for 
for that book, uh, you had a sort of problem with the Nigerian government. How was the struggle? And then, uh, like I said, like I asked before, are you also planning to continue this struggle? Because it's not just about story, it's just about, it's we are living the life, so I feel like yeah. it should continue. Uh, no, I think we should all, you too. So my, my, this is the thing, I think every society has people who do, do things well, different things well. So what I do is I tell stories, right? There are people who can do other things, so they should do their part. When the novel was made into a film, and I wasn't really involved with the process, um, but it was made by a filmmaker who was my friend and who, who I respected called B. Bandeli. And when the film was about to come out in Nigeria, the, um, the Nigerian Censors Board um, decided to ban it because they said that a particular scene in the film would incite violence. Now the scene was one that was historically accurate. It was about Igbo people being massacred at the airport in Kano. And, um, and in my opinion, you cannot hide from your history because you think it's going to affect people. I mean, it's what happened. But I think in the end, what they did, what they forced really the cinemas to do was to take out that scene in the film. Um, but later, later the, the full thing was shown. But at the time, th that was the only way to get the film shown. So they banned it for, I don't know, maybe two weeks or something. I don't remember the details. But yeah, they, they again, it's that we continue to hide from our history. And you cannot hide from history. Right? But, but it, if you have a government that's not thinking clearly, the kind of thing that you can, but you can't. Thank you very much. There was another this. There. Good evening, Shimamanda. Hello. Um, I have two questions in one. Uh, the first is in your feminist manifesto. You mentioned how uh, the um, sexism, uh, you might have witnessed more sexism in your life than racism, if I'm phrasing it correctly. Um, or you can rephrase it. And then uh, if you could say a bit more about that. And uh, second question is, um, if we are not a mother of a daughter, what can we do for girls apart from recommending them to read your books? <laughs> Uh, even that I wouldn't really recommend, no. Um, you know, there's so much you can do for girls. I don't think you have to be the mother of a girl to, to care about um, girls. There are you know, all kinds of just um, organizations one can join, um, even just mentoring young girls and starting early um, and just teaching them, you know, increasingly I think about things in a very practical way. So we, for example, we say to girls, we talk a lot about girl power and we say, you know, be strong and fearless. But, but also we don't often recognize or acknowledge that when girls do that, there's backlash. So, so on the one hand, th it, there's a sense in which girls are living today, and it's, it's, a, it, it's a strange and difficult and often dual um, world where on the one hand you're told you know be strong be fearless stand your ground but actually when you do that th there are real consequences and um, so for me it would be finding ways to mentor girls join organizations that support girls but also when in those places insist on being very practical and very honest in how we engage with girls I don't think it's enough to say girl power I think we really need to also sit back and ask ourselves whether um, we are also not the same people who try to cut down those girls and women when they stand their ground. Now, I was reading a study that's, that shows that um, it is in fact th that women politicians are expected to be virtuous in a way that m male politicians are not. So the, the standards then become quite high for women. And that's the kind of thing I think it's really important to push back on. But anyway, um, I, don't, I don't know that I said that. I don't even remember what the hell I said in We Should All Be Feminists. But I think I did say in maybe uh, somewhere that I feel lonelier in my fight against sexism than I do in my fight against racism. And it's a very personal thing, which is to say that it is based on my own unique experience and that experience is that all of the friends I have, the people I care about, um, 
and it's a, a circle of people who are quite diverse. So it's, it's black people and white people and Asian people and Hispanic people. And all of them get anti-black racism. So, so if we're having conversations about anti-black racism, they all get it. I'm never asked to prove that something was racist or to explain that something was racist. And I say that, and I, I want to say again that it's very personal because I think many black people actually experience um, constantly being told, really, is it race? Are you being too sensitive? W you know, that kind of thing. A lot of black people experience that. I don't in my own small circle. However, when it comes to sexism, with the people I love, um, I'm often sort of made to feel that maybe I'm being oversensitive or a bit dramatic when I say that something happened to a woman because she's a woman, or sometimes I'm asked to um, kind of prove that sexism is real, because often people will say, oh, there's really no problem with women. I mean, really, you know, what are you talking about? And in Nigeria in particular, I get quite a bit of backlash for taking on, and I do not apologize for it, by the way, but taking on this um, public persona of a feminist and talking about feminis feminism. It comes with incredible backlash. Um, there are people who, for whom even that word alone, they just become hostile. So that's kind of, and, and, and so because because even with the people that you love, you sometimes feel that need to justify something that seems self-evident to you, it can be very lonely, and sometimes it can be emotionally exhausting. So that's kind of what I meant. Thank you. Okay, anybody, anybody else? Oh, over there. there. Hi, good evening. Um, I was wondering if, or perhaps you've sort of answered in the previous um, question, does it ever get tiring being asked by white people about race? <laughs> because um, from my experience um, in my circle of friends who are also people of color, um, they're sort of seen as if they get to a position uh, where their voice is powerful enough for the white person to listen, um, they're always seen like they know all the answers, they know all the solutions, and they stand for all people of color out there in the world. So does that ever happen to you? And if it does, does it get tiring that you constantly get asked these questions? <laughs> um, you know what? I <sighs> Does it get tiring in certain circumstances, right? Which is... <sighs> But if I, if I sense that my value to a person or an organization is only because I am black, I don't handle it well. <laughs> and actually, often I refuse to engage. But at the same time, I am very open to having conversations about race. Because, you know, on the one hand, so, so here's what often happens in the US, I think, on the, on the left, where black people will say, on the one hand, you know, don't ask me about race. I, 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 shouldn't, I shouldn't be the person to teach you. But then on the other hand, they say, go educate yourself. And to me, those two are conflicting. Wh how is this education supposed to happen? And um, I'm also a believer in primary knowledge. So in other words, I want to learn about the experiences of people from the people who have those experiences. So that's why, since I've been here, I think I've been asking all kinds of ridiculous questions of Czech people, right? Because I want to know what it's like. Um, and, and I think the other, maybe, maybe it's also that I grew up in Nigeria where I did not experience racism or even race as an identity as a kind, as the ugly, debilitating thing that it is in America. And so because of that, I think there's a certain, it's a kind of strange privilege of being an African, an Anglophone West African. I have to be, I have to be specific because, you know, had I been a South African, obviously my experience with race, with race would be different. So being an Anglophone West African, it gives me a kind of, a strange kind of privilege where I understand race and understand racism and, and um, 
you know, experience it in the way that it manifests itself in America. But I have not, my soul has not been um, weighed down by it from the time I was born. And so it gives me a kind of, a little bit of space where I'm willing to talk about it. And, and, and because I believe that human beings can change for the better, and I also believe that often we do things sometimes from ignorance, also from malice, but there's a difference. So malice I have no time for. But ignorance, I think, is an opportunity. And so I'm very willing to talk about race if I think that it's going to change something. I mean, there are people who, there's a woman who runs this you know, fairly big organization in the US, and she read Americana, and she wanted to talk to me. And I was happy to, because at the end of that conversation, she was going to make real changes to the way she ran things. And most of all, she had become, her eyes had opened to things that she hadn't seen before about the way that black people were being treated in her organization. And for me, that's, you know, it's a very small change, but it's change and it matters to me. Thank you. Okay, no one. Thank you very much indeed. There is, oh, there is, oh, sorry, I, I didn't see, uh, oh, there are you, sorry, sorry. Thank you for the wonderful talk, and I would like uh, I would like to go back to Nigeria because I have uh, not a lot of information about the um, publishing situation, book situation in Nigeria. Are you an author well appreciated in Nigeria, or you more like a nasty child there? Uh, a what? Nasty child. A like nasty child. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that. I'm a nasty child. <laughs> that's actually, yeah, that's what really what I want to be. No, I'm <laughs> that's so funny. This is, you know, translation and in, you know, language is so interesting. I'm going to write a short story called Nasty Child. <laughs> and it starts in Prague <laughs> with a woman called Susanna, Susanna, and a man called Jakub. And then they say, ahoy. Okay. Um, but my name is Market. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just trying to use a name that seems to be quite common here. No, na na yeah, I am, I'm both. I'm both. <laughs> so in Nigeria, I am red, for which I feel quite grateful. Um, uh, my books are in the school, sort of. So, so <laughs> poor young people in secondary school have to read my books. And and um, in Lagos, Lagos is a, is a city that's known for terrible traffic. We have terrible traffic. And so everything is sold in traffic. And it's a kind of badge of honor for me that my books are sold in traffic. So that's kind of really the coolest thing. Um, as to the other thing about being a nasty child, you know, and, and I, I think I want to be fair to my country, which is to say that, yes, I get a lot of backlash for being this you know, person who speaks publicly about feminism and sexism and women in a country that, you know, in many ways is progressive, but is also quite conservative and also very religious. Um, and so often conversations about sexism are shaped by religion. So people will say, the Bible says a woman should submit to her husband, so you should never talk about equality, that kind of thing. So all of those things exist, but I do think that there is also a critical mass of Nigerians who, who are changing, you know, that young people who are having conversations about sexism, young women and young men, right? So that's actually changing quite a bit. And so on the one hand, I'm the person who sometimes a parent would say to me, I'm very worried that my daughter adores you because it means my daughter will not get married. Uh, so that kind of thing happens. But on the other hand, that same parent will say to me, you know, I, I've read all your books. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a, a dual image that I don't mind having, right? Yeah. <laughs> I can certainly tell you it's never boring. Just behind you. Thank you. Uh, hello again. Hello again. I signed <laughs> I your <would> book. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I would like also stay in Nigeria 
and ask you if also, if you can see some taste for a change in society regarding political situation. I know it's quite complicated to mm. say it all about Nigeria, but maybe from the point of view of your tribe. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't know if you know about the recent, uh, relatively recent, the NSAS protests in Nigeria that we had, what is this, September? When was it again? Like early this year? Yeah, COVID has just made my brain foggy. I don't remember what the hell. <laughs> but anyway, r recently, which was really young people um, who organized online, mostly online, and really the protests spread across, Ni well, across southern Nigeria. And, and so ostensibly, it was about ending police violence. So SARS was this police unit that was very, you know, really violent and, and, and oppressive to, to young people in particular. But it, it really morphed into a larger movement for change where young people were saying, we've had enough. We've had enough of corruption. We've had enough of a government that's not accountable to us. Um, the government ended up kind of squashing it when they um, used violence. And they had um, Nigerian soldiers actually open fire on young Nigerians. But I think what that showed is that there's, an, there's just an immense hunger for change among Nigerians. And particularly, we have a government now that is, we have a, a government that's supposed to be democratic that is not democratic. Journalists are arrested now um, because our president is a person who used to be a military head of state. Um, so I think there's a huge hunger for change and there's, a, there's an incredible amount of discontent in Nigeria at the moment. And, and for me, you know, obviously I've never felt this pessimistic about my country as I do now, but on the other hand, it can be an opportunity. So I'm kind of looking forward to see what happens in two years when we have elections. But really most people are, you know, they just really want change. Yeah. That's great, thank you. And can I ask questions? Is there a hunger for change in the Czech Republic or politics? It depends who you ask, <laughs> but I, I would say yes. <laughs> Regarding and corruption. Ah, and I want to know what it's like. So is feminism a subject that's talked about in this country? Kind of. Is sexism a problem? The women are nodding, the men are like, hmm. <laughs> if I, if I, can I ask what maybe the two top, so if sort of, so for women in Prague, which is the capital, it's urban, it's, what would be the maybe two or three top concerns for walking women, women walking outside the home? So if I, if I could go talk to the prime, it's, it's a prime minister, right? Or a president? We have both. Oh, so if I could go talk, the Prime Minister decides what happens. Yeah. If I could go talk to the Prime Minister about changing things for women, what should I tell the Prime Minister? Obviously, that's never going to happen. So we're just, this is like science fiction. It's like a science fiction novel. What, what would I tell, what would you ask me to tell <laughs> the Prime Minister for women? Okay. Be nice to hear from a woman. Are there cultural things that hold women back? So, like... Guillaume wants to say something. <laughs> 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 Guillaume is holding them back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is he French? Yeah. Because yeah. I did think his name was French. <laughs> All right, so now we know what the problem is with Czech women. We can end the conversation. Okay, it's okay. thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for a nice Thank you very chat. much. Thank you for being here. <laughs>